The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Welcome to Full Stature Ministries Kingdom Life Church. Are you ready? Because today's a challenge day. Yeah. All right. Nothing like nothing better for the first of the year than a challenge. All right. Uh, there are a lot of voices out there that I bear witness to that are talking about for the coming year uh, the f- fear of the Lord. Yeah. And uh, you know, our belief has always been that. Uh, we as a corporate church are good at what to do, um, but we like to emphasize how do I do that? All right, so I'm going to do the best I can to give you some some ways to evaluate whether or not we're making progress, whether we're going forward and upward in the things of God. Sanctification is like a stairwell, but there should be a way to find the evidence necessary, like the Lord did to me as a baby Christian. Um, he gave me uh, three concepts. He said, number one, if you truly are getting revelation, not just uh, heady stuff that's exciting, there's a difference. And real revelation where it's an unfolding of the Word of God and where He's revealing Himself to you, then it should go into three stages. It should be the revelation or the truth that He's revealing. Secondly, there should be a cultivation of that truth. Everything's not instant. So there should be a cultivation. And then lastly, he had me look for the fruit in my own life to see, did it take? (laughs) All right. And one of the best ways you could tell if a truth took, is it easier to do it in real everyday life than it is not to do it? That's a good sign, by the way. When it's easier to do it than not not to do it. And we're going to get into some of the how-tos, but uh, this this new year, I'm calling it the Fear of the Lord uh, Initiative. And it started with, I like these things I get when I'm half asleep. And, and I mean, is that God or is that me being groggy, all right? Well, I believe God really laid something on my heart. I woke up tired. That sounds strange. You just got a good night's sleep. What do you mean? I, but my first thought was I'm tired. And it was like a, almost an instant loving rebuke. No, you're fired up. And I'm thinking, I haven't had my coffee yet, so it's kind of, I would have take me a while to get this. I'm, you're fired up concept. But um, anyway, uh, that's the title of the message, Tired or Fired Up? We're going to choose, all right? And we're going to take the Fear of the Lord initiative this year as a challenge, all right? But I wanted to start with uh, some things that that I believe are uh, discernible in the body at large. And the first story that came up to me was many years ago, I went with a team of pastors, all senior pastors, and uh, we went to Mexico uh, to help out some of these, uh, a couple of these churches. But in the process, one of the pastors came to us and said, "Uh, I have a a family in my church that's really worried, and I'm at my wit's end. I don't know what to do with them. And so uh, we went, and here's the story. Uh, the, woman, the, the woman was a prostitute. She got pregnant and the, went home to live with her family, parents, actually. And uh, the parents called because they were concerned that the baby wasn't getting fed because... She had what what would you call agoraphobia would be the that would be the clinical name, but she was so ashamed of her behavior that when she went back to her family, her world got really small. She got to the point where she not only never left the house, she never left the room, and that greatly concerned the parents because they're wondering, is the baby okay because she's in there with the baby by herself and won't come out. That's pretty. That's a pretty small life, and they asked us to come, and they they tried 
everything they knew to do and nothing seemed to work and and uh, so we went and uh, actually you could see the demonic activity in the eyes the eyes they were like black as two pieces of coal and I was concerned then for the baby but I I basically just approached a very simple thing that I said the deliverance that you need is to forgive yourself you need to really forgive yourself for, for what's transpired because the condemnation was discernible, obviously. Not just the demonic activity, but the condemnation. She didn't want nobody to see her. She wanted left alone. You know, demons will tell you to do that. Isolate yourself. They that isolate themselves seek their own desire and not necessarily the counsel outside of uh, the kind of wisdom they're getting. And they're getting demonic wisdom, really. But it's very believable. So I went in and got her to forgive herself, as simple as that sounds. I didn't cast something out of her. It left. When she received forgiveness for her behavior, and I taught her how to do it from the heart, you know, she, she had known Jesus at one time prior to leaving. So she, uh, she, she received the forgiveness. She had Jesus in her heart, and I, I, I worked through that to make sure it was true. And she, yeah, she had it in her heart. She received forgiveness, and the, her eyes changed in an instant. The thing lifted. And then what I noticed was, and I think this is important, this is a message that applies to the whole church. She was free. She handed, which was a big step. First step was she handed the baby to a relative. Wonderful start. Eventually went into various rooms of the house eventually went outside and uh, we heard from the pastor uh, months later eventually went back to church it was not all instant but isn't it interesting that the solution was the very way you got in that mess you make your life smaller and smaller and smaller but then she had to actually enlarge to be able to experience life and i'm saying um with COVID and all this kind of stuff that's going on, I'm wondering how many people have done that without even knowing it, and obviously a lesser scale. But uh, it's re it'd be real easy to get into the wrong fear. I want to talk about the fear of the Lord, but the emphasis on the fear of the Lord is not fear. <laughs> all right? Uh, there's some elements, um, but it needs to be understood. Uh, the other thing that I remembered was uh, during this this time, I'm pondering this thing, and I'm seeing this this woman, and I'm saying, Lord, what's the the purpose? Of that? That's an old story. That's from uh, our missionary days, and and that. But he's saying that this is a now word. If people are going to learn the fear of the Lord, they're going to have to identify the the wrong kingdom fear. They're going to have to they're going to have to break free from that at some level. And uh, even when I was talking with leaders that were talking to, about other leaders that were friends of theirs who had really uh, fallen away, backslidden. And uh, the question that was, in this one case, the question that was asked was, well, when did you stop loving Jesus? Oh, I, I never stopped loving Jesus. I just no longer feared him. I no longer honored him with the decisions and the choices that I was making. So um, I, I felt like that was important. I just stopped honoring him, in other words. I wasn't sensitive to the, the right and wrong, but yet you, you can actually ask any backslidden Christian, do you love Jesus? And they'll say, oh, yeah, I love Jesus. I'm just not living for him right now. You know, it, it's really a common attitude. Well, you're missing something in the relationship. <laughs> uh, but in, uh, uh, in... And there's so many voices out there on the fear of the Lord for the coming year. And so I said, I want to make ready a people prepared for what's coming. And I want to challenge us to actually do something about this, not, not be a, a cute message, but rather a challenge to actually live there. And I want to give you the, the, the reasoning uh, behind that. You know, even in Deuteronomy 5.16, did you? So many people have grown up fatherless or with wicked fathers, and then they become a Christian, and they, they read scriptures like, uh, honor your mother and father, you know. Well, you know, that's, for them, that's a tough call. But that honor means it's all about your response to them. It's not, it's not what kind of father you had. 
as much as how did you respond in light of the kind of father that you had. Learn to forgive, release that, because all relation, you know, eventually, if you don't deal with that stuff, you will view God the same way you viewed uh, uh, an angry father or a, 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 any kind of a tyrannical authority figure in your life. Honor your mother and father as the Lord has commanded you. Honor, you don't have to honor their bad behavior, but you don't need to disrespect them. Okay? And you don't need to make excuses for them either. When we ministered uh, uh, church to church, uh, a lot of what we would run into is rather than people actually deal with the process of a redemptive mindset to forgive somebody, they would say, well, you know, it was the depression. They did the best they could. Okay, but you don't need to make excuses for people either. It, really, you're the one that's on the carpet. How did you respond to all of that? And uh, train up a child in the way it should go, technically, what parents are supposed to do is teach them what pleases God. Not if you're a ball player, you're going to make your son a ball player. Not if you're, uh, you were a cheerleader, your, your daughter's got to be a cheerleader. You don't make them into your image. You teach them what pleases God, and then you pull their giftings out, and you develop them, and, and you encourage them in their strengths and weaknesses. All your children are going to be different anyway, right? So anyway, but here's, here's the thing on the... Uh, uh, the concept that, that really hit me about the fear of the Lord. Uh, it was a statement that was made by Solomon. Now, we considered him, Adam was the most innocent man. Solomon was supposed to be one of the wisest men, right? Samson was the strongest, you know, whatever. But as the wisest man, when all is said and done, listen to this, Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13. All has been heard. The end of the matter. And I don't know about all my pastors know that I'm a, okay, give me the bottom line now, especially if the story's long. I want the bottom line. I'm giving you the bottom line before we get into all the details. The bottom line is, after all has been heard, the end of the matter, the final word, the conclusion is the fear of the Lord. Fear God, revere and worship him, knowing that he is and keep his commandments, for this is the whole of man. And one of the, uh, uh, just reading a book of a gentleman that was on uh, Sid Roth recently, and uh, I love the one term he used, it's all-inclusive. The fear of the Lord is all-inclusive as far as the benefits. And if Solomon, the wisest man, says, this is the bottom line, say, I like that bottom line. Now I want to know, okay, if that's the bottom line, then that's a, a, it's, it's important, significant. No, it's to me, it's an absolute priority. So it says, <clears throat> keep his commandments, for this is the whole of man. Fear God, and of course, remember now, fear, we're talking reverence, respect, acknowledgement, order, all right? And even people <clears throat> that it's, it's not in the sense of well, it's reverential awe, respect, honor, admiration. And I used acknowledgement. Uh, uh, it comes from the Hebrew word yada, which means through divine, intimate connection. And uh, that means spirit to spirit, heart to heart. Uh, when you acknowledge him, if you really have the fear of the Lord, you, you're acknowledging him. There's a sensitivity of spirit to what grieves, quenches. His, you, you care about how he feels about things. You care about how he thinks about things. You care about the choices that he would make. Now, uh, it's not the fear of, in the sense of being afraid of him, but you honor him enough that you don't want to disrespect him. Uh, I think most people can identify with that. Uh, the people who serve Queen Elizabeth, there's royalty in England, they're not scared of her, but they honor and respect her, never wanting to dishonor her. That's kind of a balanced approach to it. You know, they're not afraid of her, but they want to honor and show respect. Showing respect for authority. They even taught us that in the military. It's like, who knows what the person's like, but if he's a captain, then you, you, you respect that rank and that authority. You may not even know the person. He might beat his wife for all you know, but you, in that realm of authority, is 
you show honor and respect for that uh, level. So the bottom of the line, fear of the Lord is to honor God, uh, the, 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 to revere and worship him. Um, talk about being all inclusive. There's a real short psalm. I should read that before we get into the, I want to get into the how to's. Because if I want to challenge you for the fear of the Lord for 2022, we're going to need some practical steps as well. Psalm 128. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. When you eat the labor of your hands, you shall be happy, and it shall be well with you. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine in the very heart of your house. Your children are like olive plants all around the table. Behold Thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you out of Zion. May you see the good of Jerusalem all the days of your life. Yes, may you see your children's children be in peace. Uh, I don't think Jennifer and I are going to have any more children. We've decided not to, but we're going to have grandchildren. And we're going to see them. And we're going to watch them grow and become all that they can be, right? Uh, so, anyway, but look at Psalm 128. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord. It, it applies to your marriage, to your family. It applies to all of life. It is all-inclusive. That was the, the term that stuck with me the most. It is all-inclusive. So if you cultivated the fear of the Lord, you, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna bump into blessings, all different kind. And, and so I want to go there. Now, here's, here's another verse. You know, if it, Ecclesiastes 12, 13, that was... Solomon's final say, after all has been heard in the matter, revere and worship him, keep his commandments. This is for the whole of man. This is the whole story. This is the bottom line. All right. Now, I saw when I used to teach uh, people how to how to how to how to function from the secret place, how to function from their spirit, not just their head. I used to use Proverbs three, five, and six, and give them a, a kind of a visual. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Okay, trust. What, what does trust look like? Trust is actually yielding. You yield. You trust. You surrender. You let go. You let, you let it drop. <laughs> Anything you're holding on to tightly, let it go. Open the heart. So, trust in the Lord. With all of your heart. Now, where's the trust taking place? It's down here, down at the epicenter of your spirit, man, down at the door of the heart. All right. And this is also the seat of the emotions. And this is also, uh, many people don't pay attention to it. This is the will. The will is down here. Consent is here. Yield is here. You open the door of your heart, not your head. Your heart, you consent with your head, but you yield. All right. So it was trust in the Lord down here. I'm enjoying him spirit to spirit, heart to heart, because when you yield to him, you open the door to him. He didn't go anywhere. You have a tendency to go to other places. <laughs> but when you go to him, you draw nigh to God. He draws nigh to you. All right. He's dependable. He's there. He didn't leave. He'll never leave you or forsake you. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Now, all of your heart is your spirit, mind, will, and emotions. I'm going to trust him with all your heart. But look at the built-in instruction right in that verse of Scripture. It says, lean not on your understanding. So there's a built-in warning. You're trusting in the Lord with all of your heart. Peace is guarding your heart and your mind. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. And then it says acknowledge. That's yada. Acknowledge is not up here. Acknowledge is through divine, the highest form of yada, is divine intimate connection. Acknowledge him where? In your heart, your Bible heart. Acknowledge him in all your ways and he will direct your path. So you're going to be what? Spirit led? If he's directing your path, your will is surrendered, you're yielding to him, you're trusting in him, 
You're connected to him. You acknowledge him through divine, intimate connection. Divine, intimate connection is yada. That is the definition. So if I'm in divine, intimate connection with him, then when he directs my path, I'm actually spirit-led rather than reasoning. And then we learn uh, something that uh, the, Lord, the Lord taught me during this time. Uh, at the same time period, he was teaching me, he kept using a scripture out of 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 30, where those who honor me, I will honor. Those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Okay? Uh, God loves everybody, but honor has a reward with it. And uh, before I even get to the nitty-gritty, I'm going to throw this in now because I don't want to ever forget this. When we traveled, we saw changed lives. We saw people getting emotional healing, would get physical healings without even asking for it. But unfortunately, the one thing we couldn't help was lack of effort. There were some people that their only concept of charismatic spirituality was Joe Heavy Speaker comes, lays hands on me, imparts it to me, gives it to me. I don't do anything except receive it as a gift. And that is very common. But if what we would do then, we, had, we were going church to church, and we had so many people that wanted one-on-one -on -one ministry. They wanted private ministry. And you know how hard that is. So what we did was we discerned or made a distinction. You know what we did? We gave them something baby simple to do homework. And I was shocked at how many people couldn't do that. You know, the cat ate it or I lost it on my way here. <laughs> By homework, I meant pray through this and then tell us about it when you come. Oh, I didn't get around to it. I, I, you know, the lack of effort is where some people really stay infants in their Christian walk most of their life. Because in the beginning of your Christian life, look, I got saved. I had open visions. Uh, I had, uh, I'm a baby Christian and I'm having all this supernatural stuff going on that I was guilty because I, I had a Catholic background. I thought the only ones that should have this kind of stuff that's happening to me should be popes and bishops and cardinals. And I was a former drug addict bum. Why was this stuff happening to me? It was a legitimate perspective from my point of view. But what God was showing me was, this has nothing to do with your maturity. All of the supernatural had nothing to do with your maturity. You were still a baby Christian, and you still did a lot of dumb things. Not as many now, but a lot of dumb things during that time period. So he showed me, everything that you're seeing in those early days that looks spiritual and supernatural were actually in the babyhood stage. The fear of the Lord cannot be imparted. It's not a gift. So we're getting back to that effort thing. I'm sneaking that in there because without effort, that's why I'm calling this for the new year. Um, are you going to be tired or fired up? All right. <laughs> and this <clears throat> fear of the Lord initiative. Are you going to participate? I'm going to ask you now, then I'll ask you later. Are you going to participate? If you're watching by uh, 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 video, I'm talking to you. You're sitting there at home, maybe even isolated. Uh, of course, some of you might be being isolated because your parents are telling you to stay in your room. I'm of the age now that if somebody told me to stay in my room, I'd kind of like it. <laughs> you can't go out. Okay. You can't go to that party. Okay. But anyway, whatever the reason is, I want you to pursue God and take the challenge for the fear of the Lord initiative. Now, <clears throat> you know, there's, there's consequences for disobedience and disrespect. Those who honor me, I will honor. Those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Uh, and we know in Hebrews it talks about uh, children don't make light uh, of the Lord's discipline and don't give up when he corrects you. Uh, every correction I've ever gotten from God, I could still feel the love on it. Didn't, it wasn't pleasant, 
but spiritually I could still feel the love on it. I knew it was him uh, correcting the pathway that I was walking in or thinking or doing whatever. Okay, so <clears throat> here's where we're going to start. I have an acronym. Don't you love an acronym? I got this while I was sleeping, so don't laugh at it because I think it's going to work, all right? I woke up that one day groggy, and without my coffee, I don't, you know, when Vicki used to come to do book work at the house and stuff, she'd say, have you had your coffee? She didn't even want to talk to me if I didn't have my coffee. She was smart. I'll talk to you later. But tired or fired up. Uh, Fired, F-I-R-D. You're going to do my acronym. Just to, just humor me, all right? And if you're watching my video, humor me. Write this down. Write down the word fired, F-I-R-E-D. And then next word, up, U-P, all right? <clears throat> now, it, before I challenge somebody to do do something. I don't want dead works. So I want to I want to read a scripture from the message that kind of will lay the passage. Because how many people did we lose when we gave them homework? You know, oh, read Psalm 12 and then maybe we'll minister. Oh, I didn't have time. I didn't have oh well, it was eight verses, but you didn't have time. Okay. But that's the way we sort out who who's serious and who's not. And if you ever disciple somebody. Give them a, a tiny homework, not overwhelm them. Tiny homework, and if they can't do that, you're probably not going to be very successful at mentoring. They're not going to be, you know, there's, there's a qualification to be a disciple as well as the mentor. <clears throat> and you need to understand which of those they are or will be. All right, so FEAR, F, remember, FIRED UP. Here's the acronym, F, the fear of the Lord. And you can put next to that, worshiping in thought, word, and deed. That's kind of simple. Worship has to do with reverence and honor. So we're not, we're, we're, I don't want to get caught up in that word fear. All right. I, the initiative. And the phraseology we've used in a lot of how-tos so that people don't get into dead works and bummed out and worn out. We fight by yielding. We live by dying. We fight by yielding and live by dying. That's under initiative. We're at F and I for fired up so far. R, this is an easy one, requires. The fear of the Lord initiative requires. Well, Micah 6.8 used to say, I have showed the old man, it summed up the Ten Commandments in one, one thing. I have showed the old man what the Lord does require, to do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. And the bottom line there is really walk humbly with your God. All right? <clears throat> so the fear of the Lord initiative requires... Effort. Now, this in the school of the spirit is uniquely mine <laughs> and the message translation combined. When God was teaching me about the will, because I had a lot of friends that were burned out. They got saved. They got excited. They did everything they could do uh, and, and then got tired. And so I, when the Lord was dealing with me with the will, he showed me that my will was like an iron bar. And when I yielded my will or let go of holding on so tight on the inside, when I let go, he wrapped his strength around it. And it became a cable, and then it turned upright like this in my mind's eye, and it was a scepter. So there's your authority. I'm the initiator, not you. you. So the will was surrendered, but then it was empowered. And like a scepter of authority, 
I knew God was initiating it. Now, it also did this. He told me that in relationship with him, it was a romance of wills. And guys might not like that word romance too bad. <laughs> spirit to spirit, breath to breath, life to life. It's a romance of wills. Another person called it a dance of wills. When you think of dance, you think of activity, but you don't think of the heavy labor that's involved in it. Correct? All right. Now, listen to this. God wants you to walk with him, work with him, watch and learn as he does it. Learn, and this is important, out of that whole verse, learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Learn the unforced. See, if you want to understand the will and yielding and surrendering and being empowered by God and not your now, we'll use that word effort, all right? But your effort is to surrender and yield to the unforced rhythms of grace. Grace is empowerment. Grace is the ability to be and to do. Grace is not just unmerited favor. That's pretty, pretty, that's pretty basic. That's for a baby Christian who receives stuff by faith through grace. It's the gift. What I'm talking about is the grace of God that is empowering you to be and to do all that you can be and all that you can do. That is not a gift. That is an opportunity for you to walk in it, to walk in his empowerment, his initiative. All right. So it's a dance of wills. And let, let me read that uh, from Matthew 11. I want to read the whole verse. Matthew 11:28. And I'm purposely choosing the message translation. Are you tired? What was the title of this message? Tired or fired up? Which are you? Tired or fired up? All right. Matthew 11, 28 says, Are you tired? Worn out? Burned out on religion? Come to me. Oh, but that's, that's, there's a romance of wills starting to happen. If I surrender, if I yield, this could work. Huh? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll never recover your life. And I mean, and you'll recover your life. Get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Whoa. Walk with me, work with me, watch how I do it. Learn, oh, this is the most beautiful phrase in there. I even had Jennifer type up my notes boldness because this is this is important learn the unforced unforced is the key word learn the unforced rhythms whoa of grace that empowerment we live by dying we fight by surrendering yielding what was that what was that word uh, Christy told us one time, in England, they don't have yield signs. Give way. Give way. Okay, so if you don't understand yield or surrender, give way. All right? Something's got to sink in sooner or later. Give way means, Jesus would say, I would love it if you got out of the way and let me be God. What a novel thought, huh? Get out of the way. Give way. Yield, surrender. I don't care what word you use. Do it. <laughs> All right. Now, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. That's a good term, ill-fitting. I won't lay anything. You know, he's going to develop you according to the way he made you. And how dare you tell God how he made you? The clay doesn't tell the potter, what are you doing? What would you make me like that for? 
there are gifts and callings in you, and you are unique, one of a kind. There never was another you. There never will be another you. So quit trying to be something you're not. And worse, you don't want to die a copy. <laughs> you want to be an original you. Now, it says, I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. And during this time on, on learning about the will as a young Christian, because I was hyperactive, so I had to, I had to get a, this, I needed a bit and bridle. I wasn't at the place where God could guide me with his eye. Only my mother could do that. She could go like this. And you know, you don't want to do that. <laughs> she could guide me with her eye, but I wasn't in the place yet where God could guide me with his eye. I still needed a bit and bridle. I don't know about you. But eventually, eventually, I learned this. And God used, um, it was a Dake Bible. How many of you have ever heard of Dake? All right. He had the definitions of the, of the works of the flesh, what they meant in the Greek. Uh, the King James used the word emulation. Other translations say, uh, sometimes it's translated jealousy, envy, uh, zeal. All right. And the Greek word is zeloi. So, I, you know, so what God was showing me was that I was acting like a, a dog that I used to have. It was a tiny little dog, and yet I walk it on a leash, and its eyes would bug out. Its feet would go five times faster than we were actually going. It was wearing its feet out, but it wasn't really getting anywhere because I'm holding it back. Just a tiny little thing. But it was hyperactive. His eyes would bug out. It's like, I'm going to run constantly, and I'm going, no, we're going to walk. And God says, that's kind of like you, Dennis. And I went, oh. And he took me to that definition of zeal. And emulation, mimic, emulate, jealousy, envy, zeal. There is a zeal of the flesh and there's a zeal of the Lord. And he goes, you want the zeal of the Lord. You do not want the zeal of the flesh. And... Dake defined that zeal as, listen to this, an uncurbed rivalry spirit in religion, business, and society as well as other endeavors. In other words, you can get into this. It's an uncurbed competition. It's a competition out of control in religion and you might find yourself competing with God for who's in charge. And that's the wrong zeal. An uncurbed rivalry spirit in religion, business, society, uh, as well as any uh, other endeavors. But the works of the flesh are evident in Galatians 5.20. And my translation, New King James, says jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambition. But the works of the flesh, no matter what you call it, is an is a work coming from and being initiated from the flesh. So it's not good. <laughs> All right. So now I look and we're back to the acronym. F, fear of the Lord, I, initiative, R, requires effort. And that effort there is not carnal effort. We're getting that point across pretty thoroughly, right? It's a romance of wills. It's uh, God initiated, not man initiated. This is not something somebody can impart to you and just give it to you as a gift. This is something that you go after, and God is more than willing to give it, but it requires that surrendering to it and hungering and thirsting after it. It requires dedication. So we have F-I-R, fear of the Lord, initiative requires effort and dedication. Now you got fired, all right? If you can follow along with that so far, you're going to get fired up for 2022. Now, here's, here's the how-to that I like for dedication. Bottom line, to become consistently constant. Wouldn't you like to become consistently constant at something? <laughs> Besides sin. <laughs> to become consistently constant of something really good. All right? Here's how it looks. And this is true in the natural as well as the spiritual because this is the way the Lord taught me this in the school of the spirit. 
First of all, stage one, you are unconsciously incompetent. And this really does work. If you would put this in a little notebook and check yourself out later to see if the truth is really taking hold or not. Unconsciously incompetent means, well, Dennis, until you told me about the fear of the Lord, I was doing fine. I was unconsciously incompetent. But now you go and you preach this message, and now I am consciously incompetent. Thanks a lot. Well, it's for your good. <laughs> it's for my good, your good. So now I become consciously incompetent that the fear of the Lord is not as natural for me as breathing. Oh. So I want the third stage, which comes by reason of use, having your senses exercised by reason of use. I want to become consciously competent. And this is something you do. This is your homework. Remember now, if you don't do your homework, I know, I know who you are. All right. Your homework is to actually practice what we're going to unfold here today, to grow in the fear of the Lord because it's not a gift. It's sanctification. You have to apply yourself for it. All right? So you're going to become consciously incompetent, but you're going to move toward consciously competent. And how would you consciously be competent? You'd say, ah, I did it right that time. Oh, I did it right that time. <laughs> Maybe I didn't do it right every time, but I did it right that time. Then you start going, ah, oh, this is working. And when it becomes easier to do than not to do, you, you've arrived at unconsciously competent. You become unconscious. There's a lot of things. Two plus two is four. Most people don't have to think about that. It just... It's easier to just say it than to think about it. It's you become unconsciously competent and you become by reason of use, having your senses exercised to discern good and evil. Okay, we are up, we're up to the acronym FIRED. Are you ready for UP? Yeah, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> UP is under pressure. Under UP. Under pressure. So you've got to be walking in the fear of the Lord initiative, which requires effort and dedication under pressure. Now, what do I mean by under pressure? The world, the flesh, and the devil. It's all of life. I'm sorry, but that's the way it is. <laughs> um, we're not talking about la-la land. We're talking about the reality of the world around us, the world, the flesh, and the devil. It's a pressure. But here's the thing that in understanding this steadfast in circumstances and patient with people was the the verse that turned me over many years ago colossians 111 and that was steadfast in circumstances patient with people with joy if that's not supernatural nothing is because that's all of life people and so, tell me something that's not people in circumstances, all right? That's all of life. So steadfast and patient has to be, and we have this in all of our modules, everything that we teach, because, like I said, um, a church is pretty much known for, well, like the Bible says, you know, what to do. It's not real expository on how to do it. It requires a relationship, doesn't it? But even in this relationship, there are steps that if we can mentor someone into and make it a little bit more uh, palatable, a little bit more like create a desire in them to want to try. All right? And steadfast in circumstances, I'm patient with people. The Lord gave me those three elements. And we have it in a lot of our teachings, our manuals, our books. It was, I'm going to give you a truth. I'm going to give you homework, the opportunity to cultivate that truth. Or you can just say, oh, that was a good teaching and forget about it. I'm going to give you a truth. I'm going to give you the opportunity to cultivate that truth. And then I want you to be honest with yourself and not be a know-it-all and see if that truth really is bearing fruit in your life. In other words, is it working? 
and from around the world, people taking a 60-day challenge are saying, I don't, we used to get some that would say, I don't even know how it works, but it does. <laughs> All right? So if it's working, that's fruit. And that's what changes lives, when they see that something works. I don't know about you, but I agree with Jennifer. She said, I'm not interested in rabbit trails that go nowhere. I want something that works, then apply it, and by reason of use, become more proficient at it. Practice makes permanent into your life, to where then you walk in unconsciously competent in certain areas of your life. All right, under pressure. Strengthen with all might, no matter what the world, the flesh, and the devil's throwing at you. All right? Now, now I want to cover some of the benefits of the fear of the Lord. That's, this is the acronym is your challenge. That's your challenge for 2022, to, to, to look at that and see if there's any shortcomings or anything that needs a little uh, firmed up in the process. <laughs> but here are some of the attributes of the fear of the Lord. And remember, the most important thing is, regardless of all these scriptures, it's all inclusive. In other words, if you walked in the fear of the Lord, you can read... Uh, uh, um, Psalm 34, I will bless the Lord at all times. Fear the Lord, you saints, for there's no want. There's no lack for those who fear the Lord. That's pretty all-inclusive, isn't it? That's Psalm 34. and Read that one. Psalm uh, 128, there's only six verses there. But the whole thing is all of life is blessed for those who walk in the fear of the Lord. I say we ought to be challenged to say, God, Holy Spirit, reveal and teach me to develop this more effectively in my life. If this is all inclusive, I want, I want the bottom line. I want that change. And I have to realize that a lot of my Christianity, look at signs and wonders as a baby Christian, saved, filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, there's people that quit, think they got it all now. All of that was given to you. You didn't even enter into sanctification yet. You didn't even enter into the work of the cross. All of that was handed to you. And there's people that think that because they got saved and speak in tongues, they're done. I got the whole package. Oh, man. All of that was in the early stages of gifting. I'm talking about a work of the cross where you're building an, an intimate relationship with you, where you're growing in the grace and in the knowledge of God, where you're maturing. Now, some of the attributes of the fear of the Lord. It gives wisdom. Wisdom versus IQ. Uh, so many people emphasize the IQ. But wisdom is the ability to use the knowledge. And the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So really, you know what? You might think you know a lot in your mind with your IQ, but your IQ is not EQ either. And I've seen some very intelligent people that are very evil, <laughs> right? It's not necessarily emotional maturity. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and all those who follow His commandments have good understanding. His praise endures forever. Proverbs 4, 7, Wisdom is the principal thing. It does not say knowledge is the principal thing. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. All right? Now, James chapter 3 talks about the two kinds. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good conduct. Works that are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy, self-seeking, do not boast or lie. This wisdom does not descend from above. It's earthly, sensual, and demonic. And trust me, I've heard arguments of people of stuff that was just plain evil, and their arguments had a had a, 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 a false wisdom from their point of view. A good argument, in other words, from their point of view. Look at Psalm 128. It even talks about having a good marriage. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house, your children like olive plants all around your table. It even blesses the marriage. People wonder, understanding what's going on in a marriage, husband and wife. If they both walked in the fear of the Lord, it'd be bliss. 
one walks as being Lord, it's not. <laughs> Psalm 112, blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandment. His descendants will be mighty on the earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. There's, you, you talk about, people are more familiar with generational curses than they are generational blessing. The generational blessing is what gets passed down that's significant. So you be that person passing something down. You be the man. <laughs> you be the woman. It, Psalm 112, blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. His descendants will be mighty on the earth, and the generation of the upright will be blessed. That's a, that's a powerful statement. That's worth living for. And Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he shall go, and when he is old, he will not depart. Teach them what pleases God and give them the bottom line of fear of the Lord. Sometimes you major on the minors in raising children when the primary thing is teach them what pleases God. Not to be like you, but to teach them what pleases God. Behold, for thus shall a man be blessed who fears the Lord. It releases the blessing of God in general. The fear of the Lord releases the blessing. This is really all conclusive. I like the all conclusive. I don't know about you, but I like it. If you could do this one thing, we'd be doing great, right? It would be releasing a manifold cornucopia of blessing, all different kinds. It releases the blessing of God, Psalm 128, verse 4. Oh, listen to this one, Matt. Nobody wants this one. Proverbs 10, 27. The fear of the Lord prolongs life. Right? Everybody's ready to escape and go be with Jesus? Nah. Uh, the fear of the Lord prolongs life, Proverbs 10, 27. It brings healing. But to you who fear my name, the fear of the Lord, the son of righteousness, will rise with healing in his wings, and you will grow out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. In other words, you grow out healthy. So there's healing and there's healthy, all as a byproduct of the fear of the Lord. I tell you what, it gives comfort, Acts 9:31. The churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. These were difficult times, circumstances, and with people, but they were walking in the comfort of the Holy Spirit in the fear of the Lord. We've got to have, uh, that's the up part, under pressure. <laughs> World, flesh, and devil is out there. It's not going to change. It enables you to receive revelation. Psalm 25, 2. Who is the man who fears the Lord? God will instruct him in the way he should choose. We already did that one. We showed you how to trust in the Lord with all your heart. And he, will, he will direct your path. It enables you to recognize evil. Proverbs 3, 7. It creates security. Psalm 16, 8. It is a source of life. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. Proverbs 14, 27. This is a tiny list. But it goes on and on. Are you getting the point that if you walk in the fear of the Lord, it's all inclusive? And it even gives... Anybody having trouble sleeping? says it makes us sleep in contentment and satisfaction. Proverbs 19.23. The fear of the Lord leads to life so that one may sleep satisfied and untouched by evil. There's a whole lot of you people need that one, right? I've heard more Christians talk about during the day I'm fine, but at night, horrible attacks, all right? Start praying that and saying uh, that I am going to sleep. You give your beloved sleep and I'm releasing myself into your hands during the night season to be my shield and my buckler and my high tower. Because as it says here, the fear of the Lord, Lord, I want to grow in the grace and the fear of the Lord that my sleep is satisfied and untouched by evil. The fear of the Lord, one does depart from evil. It, it gives peace. It delivers from your enemies. It gives light in the darkness. It creates a generosity of heart. 
it's all inclusive. It gets now. Here's the part that I want you to see when we talk about all inclusive. This was one of the verses the Lord used early with me that puzzled me at first. But it says it gives us riches, honor, and life. And I was always mm, don't don't talk money, uh, riches, honor. I've seen too many people go down the tubes with riches. Okay, but it says by humility, Proverbs twenty two four, and the fear of the Lord our riches, honor, and life. And by golly, all through scriptures, they're talking about tangible riches, spiritual as well as natural, for the person. Who better could God give something to than someone that feared the Lord? Hmm? It's not money and riches are not evil. It's the love of the money that is evil. But the love of the fear of the Lord as a primary, that's beautiful. By humility and the fear of the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord. Wealth and riches will be in his house. And his righteousness endures forever. God bless them with, the, with, with riches for the advancement of the kingdom and for the purposes that God would lay. Someone that's under the fear of the Lord would know how to do all of that anyway properly. Meekness, which is closely linked with the word humility. And one who is meek knows that even in insults and injuries coming from men are permitted. And the real key to a person walking in the fear of the Lord is they don't, uh, they don't fight or resist the things that are coming against them because they're not that concerned with self. Most of you defend yourself or want to voice your opinion. Or you want to vent about something. Quite frankly, that's all coming out of self. Because the person that's truly walking in the fear of the Lord is letting God handle a lot of that stuff. Now, here's some uh, the fear of the Lord initiative. Are you going to participate? Yes. All right. I want everybody to participate. You're challenged. This is your homework. The fear of the Lord. Fired up. You've got the acronym now for fired up. Look at it. Reevaluate what areas need uh, fortified. But here's something. Here's uh, quotes from famous people. Gregory the miracle worker, 200 years A.D., was bishop of the early church father, and he believed that the fear of the Lord was the mother of all virtues. Okay? When he took office in uh, Caesarea in the northern Asia Minor, there were only 17 Christians. By the time of his death, there were only 17 unbelievers. <laughs> Oh, pays a walk in the fear of the Lord as a primary virtue, the bottom line. St. John of Antioch said about the fear of the Lord, if we have the fear of the Lord, we lack nothing. And if we do not have it, then we are poorer than all men, even if we had a kingdom. Ephraim the Syrian, the one who fears the Lord is above all other fears and leaves all the horrors of the world behind him. He is far from all fear. No fear ever comes near him when he fears God and observes his commandment. All right, are we ready? Are we going to be challenged? 2022, we're fired up. We're not tired, we're fired up. And we're going to pursue this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.